In 1991, Clarence Thomas was confirmed to the Supreme Court by a vote of 52 to 48. It's interesting to note that of the 52 yeas, 11 of them were Democrats. Now what if they all voted strictly party lines? The result would have been very different. In March of 2016, Merrick Garland was nominated by then-President Barack Obama. But his process was stalled out because Congress felt that the president, with 310 days left in office, shouldn't get to nominate a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court. However, only 11 days after taking office, the current president nominated Neil Gorsuch he was confirmed by a vote of 54 to 45. No Republicans voted against him, but two Democrats crossed the aisle to confirm his appointment. Had they voted party lines, the result would have been the same. Sandra Day O'Connor was a unanimous confirmation in, 1990, in 1981. Antonin Scalia, was a unanimous confirmation in 1986. Anthony Kennedy, a unanimous confirmation in 1988. Clarence Thomas, 52 to 48 in 1991. But Ruth Bader Ginsburg was confirmed by a vote of 96 to 3 in 1993. The three names were Republicans, but even Strom Thurmond voted for RBG. Neil Gorsuch, 54 to 45 in 2017, voting almost completely down party lines. And this brings us to 2018. Wild card. Will we have another Clarence Thomas situation on our hands? Will sexual misconduct allegations be an unpleasant distraction from the inevitable vote down party lines? Will politicians have the guts to cross the aisle. Are Democrats playing unfairly? Are Republicans playing unfairly? Are we doomed to the existence of partisan politics? Is this partisan justice? Politicians have hijacked justice. And petty jealousy, greed, and power is the ransom. The Apostle John said to Jesus, Jesus, we saw someone doing excellent work and invoking your name, but we told him to stop because he wasn't one of us. Now remember the disciples. Remember last week we discussed how the disciples were concerned about who was the greatest. And now the disciples are afraid and jealous. They're afraid they're going to lose their power. They were caught in the trap of being braggadocios. They wanted to be the greatest disciples. This is a lifetime appointment, and they didn't want anybody questioning their power because, after all, they were the OGs of the real Messiah. So let's unpack Jesus' response. Let's unpack what Jesus says. He makes three points. He says, if someone is doing something great in my name, they're not going to badmouth me. Jesus says, if they're not against us, then they're for us. And Jesus says, if someone gives you a cup because you belong to Christ, they're not going to lose their reward. See, this is Jesus Politics 101. Jesus was political, and there's no way around it. And if you don't think that Jesus was political, I invite you, please, reread the Gospels and read them through that lens. Because there is definitely politics in the Bible. Now, Jesus wasn't concerned with building a church. He wanted to start a movement. Jesus wasn't concerned with growing a church. He was a reformer. Jesus didn't like things the way that they were, and Jesus wanted them to change. Jesus troubled the waters. Those three statements to John 
in a translation that I was reading, were placed under the heading, Jesus forbids sectarianism. This is the opposite of what Jesus is doing, because Jesus is forming a sect. His disciples are beginning to separate themselves from others. They're beginning to buy into this us versus them mentality. And while Jesus is trying to reform an old thing, the disciples, they're trying to start a new thing. How dare, how dare those people cast out demons in your name? We're the inner circle. We're the select disciples. We are the right ones. And because the children are still there, remember the children were there last week, Jesus uses them once again as an object lesson. And Jesus offers my go-to scripture for protecting children. And then Jesus offers my go-to scripture for biblical literalists. Because Jesus says if your hand, your foot, or your eye causes you to sin, remove it. Jesus can't mean that literally. That's harsh. Then in the passage, there's this bit about the salt, but I'm just going to skip over that part. Because I want to talk about the final, the final piece of that scripture passage. Be at peace with each other. Be at peace with each other. How are we doing on that? Jesus tells his disciples, his followers, I want to make justice great again. And in order to make justice great again, you can't be divided. If you want to make justice great again, you have to be at peace with one another. The law and the prophets and Jesus, all about justice. So if you really want justice, be at peace with one another. Be at peace with your enemies. Be at peace, certainly, with others who want the same thing as you, but just see it in a slightly different way, or I'm really not quite sure it's the same way to get there. The Gospel of Mark is the oldest surviving sequential account of the career of Jesus. And it represents the very first attempt to write a consecutive report of what Jesus said and did. The original generation of Jesus' followers were dying. And with their deaths, who would be regarded then as the living voice of tradition? Who would carry on these stories? And there's a sense of urgency in the Gospel of Mark. Mark uses the word immediately, eight times in the first chapter alone. He told the council to be watchful three times in a single paragraph. There's a sense of urgency that Jerusalem is going to fall. And there's rising tension between the Jews and the Romans and the Christians. And it's all coming to a head. And Jerusalem and the temple are in play. It is the end of the world as they know it. And what's more, Jesus said that he would come again at the end times, and this is looking certainly like the end times. Jesus is coming. Get busy. It's believed that Mark was writing for the Roman people. Romans didn't, they didn't grow up with the Old Testament, so they weren't really concerned about Jesus fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. The Romans were conquerors, and they were soldiers, and they would care about the miracles that Jesus performed and the people that he helped. Mark didn't write so much about what Jesus said as what Jesus did. And one interpreter believed that if Mark's gospel was made into a movie, it would be an action movie. Perhaps the action of this movie would show people a better way to live. A better way to live. A better way to live. Isn't that the role of religion? I mean, many people view religion and church through that lens. Religion 
church and the Bible, they're supposed to teach us values and morals and ethics. We've kind of gotten away from that in politics. There used to be a time when people would say, I want my leaders to be morally upright. I want them to be good, church-going folk. In our history, our country's history, we've only had one Catholic president. We've only had one Mormon candidate as a nominee for a major political party. We've only had one Jewish nominee, and that was for vice president. I think it's safe to say that we've had many Protestant politicians who are church for the camera kind of candidates. The religious affiliation of a candidate may not matter to the voting people, and clearly values, morals, and ethics do not matter. In September of 2018, the good people of the United States are faced with what seems like it's going to be a lengthy Supreme Court nomination. On the one side, we have a loving father and husband and coach who was afforded a lovely Ivy League education and does have an impressive resume combining law and politics. But on the other side, we have a very different story. At last count, there were four separate allegations brought against the nominee, back, dating back to his high school years. And both sides are very concerned about the allegations because there's ramifications for both sides. But what I find the most fascinating in all of this is people's reaction. The reaction of the public to these allegations. We have heard, well, boys will be boys. I've heard, tell your boys that when they're talking to girls, they'll need legal representation. And we have heard, what took her so long? He shouldn't be held accountable for what happened when he was young. But also in the news this week, Bill Cosby, sentenced three to ten years. Boxer Victor Ortiz was charged with rape days before a scheduled fight. Also, last Thursday, Mel Watt, director of the Federal Housing Finance Agency, was set to testify for alleged sexual harassment of a female subordinate. Now, we don't get to vote who's going to be the next Supreme Court Justice. We don't get to vote on who is going to be a great athlete. We don't get to vote on who is going to be a successful actor, writer, director. But our words and our actions and our responses will shape the next generation of young men and women. <clears throat> a 17-year-old woman from Rapid City, South Dakota, said that she felt it odd as a student to hear grown-ups dismissing the significance of Mr. Kavanaugh's character in high school. And she said, for me and my friends, his past is our now. And she fears that boys will learn that what they do in high school won't really affect your future at all. So go do the damage that you need to do now. His past is our now. We don't get to vote on what happens in our past. But we do get to teach about what should and what should not happen. Respect isn't legislated. Love is not a vote. Respect and love, they are shown, and they are taught. I will never endorse a candidate from the pulpit, but I will endorse love and respect in whatever form that that takes. I will not speak highly of any candidate who is ethically bankrupt, 
but I will share stories that highlight values and morals consistent with Jesus' message of justice, love, redemption. This church should speak to injustice. This church should speak to love. This church should invite a people that is starving for redemption. The world is hurting. Our country is divided. And people in our community are struggling. So yes, we are in politics because we have been given the power to heal God's world. We have been given the power to unite God's people. And we have been given all of the resources that we need to help God's struggling children. Jesus troubled the waters. Jesus started a movement. It's time to be a part of the movement. Amen.